We are live at the MSS DMV, our first panel, our early bird panel. Um, thanks for joining us. We're going to set the scene, ask some pretty critical questions. We're delighted to be joined by Richard Stainings, Chief Security Strategist at Silera, uh, Dr. Satyam Priyadashi, Chief Data Scientist at Halliburton, Jamie Sanderson-Reed, Director of Cyber Governance, Risk and Compliance at the AES Group, Tom Watson, President at MSP Go, and David Emerson, CISO and CIO at Seoul Cyber Managed Security Services. It's a pleasure to have you on. How are you doing? Very well, thank you, Phelan. Thank you for uh, inviting us. Great My to be here. Wonderful. My pleasure. It's, it's great. Um, we, we, we're at a critical juncture in the world of DMV. Lots of things going on. Uh, of course, the world loves paying attention to the DMV as well. And may I say, what starts in the DMV might uh, have ripple effects uh, over different places. And you'll notice, uh, our audience will notice, and of course, our fine panel will notice that our panel is quite an interesting mix. We have end customers, we have uh, third parties, we have uh, data scientists, and I, I, I want this to, in a way, be reflective of the kinds of debates that we have uh, throughout today. Um, so obviously, we're, we're looking at the top post holder of tomorrow and whether or not that has an impact. But but let me start with a, a quite a high level question, considering this is the first panel of the day. We're in the DMV. Can we paint a picture? David, let me start with you and I'll work my way around. How has the threat landscape of the DMV evolved over the last couple of years? Um, I think over the last couple of years, you've, you've started seeing the participation of, or at least the, the visibility of more private sector groups, um, smaller uh, and medium enterprises. Um, and I think that at the executive level, um, a necessarily more technical executive suite, uh, you know, it's, it's not enough even in the DMV to, to get along with, you know, purely a strategic mindset. And I don't think the technical capability is, is at odds with a strategic mindset. Um, and so I think that in the last few years, we've seen and, and will see in the coming years, the CIO and you know, CSO of the future um, kind of being able to get their hands on an executive strategy, of course, but uh, digging all the way down to, to an execution level to maintain credibility, to attract talent and uh, really, truly manage a team and a program of effectiveness. Indeed, and 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 that that is an evolution, especially for the managed security service. Um, well, le le let me put a similar question to you, Jamie, because of course you're on the other side. Um, I wonder, um, can you paint a picture of the DMV? Is does it really exist as a, as an entity? How is it? How's the threat landscape evolved? Uh, that's a that's a really really interesting question. So uh, because. It absolutely does, but I, I think we can all agree over, especially even the last year, but over the last decade, with internet globalization, all the things that we're aware of, the world has become a lot smaller. So while the DMV does exist, I think the threat landscape that we're concerned about is the same threat landscape that the entire world is concerned about right now. And as an end user, if I had to go with the top three concerns that I have in the threat landscape right now, it would be zero day vulnerabilities, ransomware, and supply chain attacks. And I mean, for the last year, those we can all go to examples where maybe we weren't directly impacted, but we had to be concerned and we had to respond to these um, this, to these new threats and these escalating threats compared to prior years. And we rely heavily on our MSS to support us in capability to respond to these. I like that. And, and and also, by the way, Phew, thank you. I, I realized by asking if the DMV exists, I was about to torpedo the whole event if the answer was no. Um, so so thank you. Um, I, I, I like that. And I like this spectrum uh, that, that, that we have on this panel because because that's what I, I'm trying to achieve. Um, uh, on on the larger size uh, of companies, Dr. Pridarshi, uh, you, you know, had a button very large. Um, has that resonated with you or has, has nothing really changed? Because obviously you might have been working in areas that just haven't shut down, haven't really needed to shut down. Um, or, or, or is that not the case? Yeah, so Falun, good morning, everyone. Um, I, I put it in a different way. I wear my hat of data scientist and I think that uh, the landscape is evolving everywhere. And uh, as, as digital disruption is taking place, it gives us a new landscape and if you look at it um, 
you know, it, I think it's a gold mine for data scientists, a uh, problem for the security professionals, uh, but uh, the bringing the new technologies together to solve them will be interesting. So a couple of things, if you look at in the last, uh, I would say three, last three years or so what has happened, right? Everything is becoming software defined. And I'm, look, I'm not only saying just in general, uh, the supply chain, but if you look at the bigger industries like energy industry, manufacturing, and I spend most of my time in energy sector, um, then if, if we look at the other aspect, the digital identities, or we call digital twins, or whatever we want to call it, uh, but digital identities have grown significantly. Right? The numbers say people like us may have about at least 30 digital identities somewhere. Correct? Uh, and But this is not just to the people, but also to, to the machines as well. And the second, the machine to machine communication has increased as Jamie was pointing out the supply chain issue. Now, if you look at the automated supply chain number of machine to machine communication will actually increase and continue to increase. And the third one, fourth one is like basically the net web of network of APIs. You know, when you log into one app, it says, do you want to connect to Google or Facebook or whatever? You don't know who, who is reading your, your identity now. Now, these things um, are all evolving. And uh, the, the biggest challenge that you see in the last um, uh, three, four years is that the CPU power that we have on even a small device like that is significant, right? And that causes completely a different landscape from a data point of view that you can actually access uh, and, and actually uh, create more threats ar around the world. So this whole landscape, whether it is DMV, but DMV is the governance <laughs> area where the critical infrastructure rules come out. Uh, I think it's, a, it's a, these things have to be, the framework has to be really mod modified in that sense. No, I like that. And, 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 and of course that paints a picture of some of the critical infrastructure i know infoguard has its 16 areas so actually lots of things are critical now which you know um, maybe in other countries not so much but uh, but pure play critical that we would understand like oil and gas that's that's uh, that's very key but using that as a segue then richard welcome uh, the world of healthcare um is there something to be said with the leader of tomorrow being specialized given that We've got all these MSS players. Should should we end up with a specialized CEO dedicated to one vertical, or or, or is there a different uh, approach needed? So you know, healthcare is one of the sixteen critical infrastructure industries identified under the Obama era PPD twenty one um, definitions. You know, like energy, like power distribution, education. You know, healthcare is a critical infrastructure industry, and, and we are you know at this very time living through a very heightened uh, threat surface as a result of you know the the russian invasion of ukraine and all kinds of threats coming out of uh, the kremlin so you know those those critical infrastructure threats i think sit on top of the ones that that jamie you know walked us through earlier so we're dealing with those those types of threats in addition to supply chain and everything else now from a healthcare perspective, there are certain nuances about how do you go about protecting patient safety as well as cybersecurity, right? So, you know, in, a, in an energy or other critical infrastructure industry, you can shut down parts of your network if needs be to reroute, reroute uh, traffic, to reroute power. Um, you can't really do that in a hospital environment. You can't shut down grandpa in order to reroute traffic to save grandma, right? I mean, there's, a, there's a, an obvious cost to these sorts of things. So we have to be very cognizant of what devices do on our networks, whether they're in a life sustaining or, you know, a, a patient critical uh, capacity that they're operating and, and therefore develop run books that allow us to understand the nuances of the devices on our network and take uh, appropriate security uh, actions uh, when those devices either come under attack um, or when they become compromised. No, that's that that's really key. And already I'm seeing some similarities between some areas of non-healthcare related security. Indeed, AppSec, you can't take the app down uh, whilst it's live necessarily. It's not life-threatening. But I, I think that there's going to be some nice little um, 
you know, things to, to pull, to pull through, which then means if I come to you, Tom, welcome. Um, Tom, I, I, I first welcomed you at the MSS Denver, uh, uh, in fact, along uh, with Richard for the first time, I think. So, so welcome uh, to the DMV. Uh, I know this is your home anyway, but uh, <laughs> um, what do you think is special about the SMBs in the DMV and how that uh, interacts with the MSP? And, and what I'm getting at is, are there really any, SM, are there really truly any small businesses anymore that are truly small, given that they're a hot skip and a jump from something very large? Um, exactly, Phil. And as you know, yeah, I, I grew up in the DMV and I owned an MSP in the DMV for 15 years. And so I kind of went through this period of time where we went from, you know, cybersecurity wasn't even talked about to where it became really a big thing. And I worked with the government contractors and with government and with private industry as well. And it's so intertwined in the DMV that at any business level, you are dealing with layers much above you, often, often within just a couple of iterations to the highest level of government. And so what we see here, and we talked about this the other day, is that in the DMV, we've had to deal with the security issues, both physical and cyber, at, at a much sooner level than, than many other areas have. And we are kind of lead the, lead the world in many ways in trends for security. And what we do here is exported to other places and becomes the common place to handle security. And I think that's an important thing to consider because we are setting the trends and we establish that our government is very much on top of it and it flows all the way down through every level of business in the DMV. And, and so given that this event combines an MSP, MSS and end customer audience, where, where does that leave the top post holder? Because I suppose, Tom, this is ostensibly what we're trying to find out. Um, is this top post holder a third party manager or is the third is it, is it a a risk um a supply chain risk manager for the uh, msp of tomorrow because a lot of msps never speak to an in-house it person they speak to the cfo uh, uh, tom is, is is that right that is right a lot of times it's on the msp and what i've found i still work with a lot of msps in the dmv and other areas is that you're forced to make a decision of how much of the security you're going to handle where you're gonna to start to bring in outside resources. Are you as an MSP gonna use an MSSP or are you gonna require your client to handle that certain portion and have staff in house and deal with that? Along with the convergence we are seeing between the combination of MSPs and MSSPs is that becomes more of one thing. I don't think anymore you can just be an MSP and forget about the security piece. You're gonna to have to do a part of that. You're gonna have under your contract with clients, you're going to have some of that responsibility you have to take on and you're going to have to find a way because you are not off the hook if there's a security incident. You're going to have to have a plan and accountability. And the I know Jamie was talking about the other day about the insurance along with it. There's a lot of considerations now we didn't have to use to concern ourselves about. I like that because 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 then let's get get onto that. Not every MSP uh, can be a fully fledged MSS, but there must be a flavor of it. Yet, David, you have a very interesting story and case study because you are an MSS, but you have a slightly different focus than other MSS. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. And and with regards to the DMV specifically as as a region, you know, it's not practical anymore to be merely a widget maker for a massive prime on a contract. Um, you inherit controls. CMMC made that explicit, but that was implicit prior to that. Um, and you know, when I say that the, the CSO and the CIO of the future needs to be needs to be able to merge technical and strategic thinking better than ever. Um, though I imply that that's an individual, the fact of the matter is, depending on the company, it may be more practical for that to be an outside organization. Um, if you're going to be subject to the same controls as you know large prime contractors um or you know controlled unclassified information handlers or whatnot um you know you may find that for your business it is more practical to hire that that duty out that liability to a refined mature operation um and so you know what, what tom is getting at is is right on the the fact of the matter is that that needs to be a discussion whether that's with cf between cfo and legal or whether that's the, the CFO to a fairly non-technical CIO who recognizes that they don't have it covered, um, whatever that is, you know, the, the, the companies in the DMV area at a much, much, an increasingly smaller scale um, need to recognize that they have a profile uh, that must be addressed. And so 
Uh, fundamentally, that's that, that's what we founded Soul Cyber on. You know, we we ultimately founded it on this notion that there is an increasing market for companies that cannot handle the profile that they have attracted. Um, so I, I think Tom is right. I think that that discussion is happening more than more than ever, and it's not necessarily merely technical folks that are having that discussion. Um, in fact, oftentimes it's folks that, that don't feel like they can attract the technical talent necessary, and it's not their core competency. So they hire an MSS. And, and David, that's that's an inherently quotable quote. I think we can we can go with. Uh, they they have a profile that they cannot handle. I like that. I think I think that might be a key facet of today's uh, event. We can we can sort of run with that. I think. Um, uh, now I'll, I'll get back to to the model in in a bit, but Jamie, um, let, me, let, let, let let me come back to you. Um, taking a step back, when when we've done these events in the past, especially during you know the last two years, we did the whole oh everyone's working from home, oh everyone's going back to the office. Now they're going back from home again. Now they're doing hybrid, right? But the one debate that people thought may be solved by now is the cloud on prem debate, which also reflects a little bit of the outsourcing insourcing debate. I don't really think this is the case, but I'll just throw it out there. Has the cloud on-prem debate been solved, Jamie? Yeah, no, and, and I think it's a good point and it, it aligns with what David was talking about, that focus being more on people resources. Now we're looking at infrastructure, right? And it, 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 it's a very similar situation in that, do we have the capability does it make sense financially for us to manage these resources in-house versus out so outhouse and in, in, in um, the cloud area we're talking about infrastructure um, it I, I don't think it has been a hundred percent answered especially in the DMV especially when you get to some of the highly regulated I, I, my company operates in the energy sector so there's definitely some spaces where we cannot operate in the cloud. But it's a big gray because there's a lot of other places that are, you know, within the organization. So we have the IT and the OT. We leverage the cloud extensively for IT, less so for OT, depending on the regulations. So um, my answer is, you know, the cloud is here to stay. We're going to continue to use it. I think eventually we're going to even have to you start to accept that it makes sense to use it in the most highly regulated spaces, including OT. We're not quite there yet, um, but the best practices are there. And, and really, for the most part, the best practices are the same as what we have on-prem, but it just requires a greater degree of trust. And that's where our third-party risk management and all the different types of assurance that we have um, for the cloud providers comes into place. No, and that, yeah. and I should say, and it relates to our MSS as well, because we have to have all of that integrated. Um, uh, run books. Richard was mentioning run books. So those run books have to address that aspect as well. That, that, is, that is key because um, for all the XDR and uh, MDR and EDR products out there, there's an emerging one called CDR. It's cloud detection response. It, it can apparently uh, you know, swim through cloud and natively break down multi-cloud walls and and things like that and and i don't know is it real it, it, it's not for me to say and we don't have anybody here rep representing that but something has to give and you also mentioned ot which is kind of uh, fun because there are some mss players that say we look after it and ot but they don't and this is the critical word they don't say we look after it with ot we can we can get onto that dr Piyadashi, obviously ot very big in uh, oil and gas sector um what do you what do you think the the third party answer for that is so i think um uh, correctly as you said it and ot mss and they talk about both of them but they don't talk about together uh, because it's it's a uh, it's a unique challenge it's in one sense yes it's a physical device yes it is a network but i think the use use case and where the uh, the accessibility of the data is at different time scales and 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 the actions that you take from that are a different time scale. So uh, you manage it in a different way, uh, where you can really take actions in real time where it's needed, and then rest of the data can come in and look at it. So this uh, whether we can put uh, some kind of cloud computing paradigm into the field versus uh, back office, as Jamie said, back office is much more uh, IT is much more on cloud and. Most of the energy companies have actually moved on to it, especially after 2020, right? But when it comes to OT, it's still there. 
people have been building uh, what you call edge networks. Uh, people are building fog networks uh, to see if they can control the space and and do certain things with it. But I, I think it's a it's still a long play um, because uh, one of the things that's happening in the energy sector in general, whether it's wind, wind or geothermal or whatever you want, oil and gas, is mo more or more deployment of uh, edge devices. Now you really can't move data from edge devices to back office in real time. Uh, of course, five G can change that game, uh, right? Uh, again, that that's a cost, and then comes with its own challenges. But I think um, this ITOT merging and leverage of cloud is both evolving. Uh, it's I don't think it's um, one or the other way. It will be always either mix of public, private, and a hybrid cloud. And it will be, and uh, for many of the energy companies which are global, uh, you also kind of, even though GPDR is part of what they call PII data, but GPDR actually plays a role in that, in, in machine data as well. So it's going to be a really, a, I would say a little bit of a complex network of deployment of cloud computing paradigm. And, and, and you, you mentioned critically 5G and, and, and its implications, because I don't think some of the MS, well, who am I to actually judge? But I, I ask, are some MSPs and some MSS players out there ready for the amount of data that 5G can generate, uh, just as are they ready for immutable identities and, immuta and central bank digital currencies? Are they, are they ready for that? Mm, I don't know. Um, and in fact, I saw the other day, there's a 6G conference out there. So it's, a bit, it's a bit premature, but um, I, I, want to, I want to definitely go. Um, uh, Richard, you, you, you very kindly you know, uh, moderated uh, other events uh, that, that we've done and, and, and you know, spoken at many. For our panel to ask, how relevant is the top post holder? I guess maybe we could also say, do you think that all these third parties care if it's a CISO, a super architect, um, a super OTIT converged player, do, do you think they really care? I, I, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I, I would say they would care, yes. Obviously, you know, any MSSP should really care about the customer that it's, uh, that it's, it, it's working for uh, and obviously support the, uh, the position where it, it joins that organization. Um, uh, and I would encourage any MSSPs here to look very carefully at managing those relationships very well, because you know we've we've all seen where uh, MSS MSSs or MSSPs you know come unstuck because they don't have that dotted line relationship into all of the technical leadership roles uh, that they they need in order to be successful because their contracts managed by the CFO or by legal or, or some other entity within the organization. But I would say that you know, to take a step back to you know some of the other conferences that you know we've had within the MSS series, uh, Fellum, to to challenge the actual leadership role. What is the leadership role in, in IT today? Is it still, you know, the role of the CIO, the chief information officer, now that we're not doing, you know, the level of custom development that we were doing, you know, 10, 20 years ago, right? Um, is that role now, the CIO role, really one of chief innovation officer uh, or some other chief digital officer, chief something other officer there, because we're selecting packages now, right? We're selecting solutions, we're selecting services. We have platform as a service, we have security as a service, we have application as, or as a service, everything is as a service. We've now got a modular architecture uh, that we're desperately trying to glue together with different outsourcers and, and different entities and even different you know, technologies like OT and IoT and, and IT, for example. So that role has really become about integrating those discrete modules together and doing so in a secure way. Now, one of the, the, the panels that I moderated some while ago, we talked about the CIO, the CIO reporting into the CSO because security is now you know, a fundamental business risk. It's an impediment to new business offerings if it's not done right. And it's a pretty surefire way to close your company down if you do it wrong, right? 
um, reputations get trashed, and we've seen you know some fines and some punitive damages and some restitutions here that are absolutely staggering um, amounts of money here. So you know maybe we're at the juncture of some some pretty massive changes here. You know, um, you know, I, I think a lot of the a lot of the folks on the, on the call already mentioned that. Tom, I know you and I have had conversations on some of that in the past. Yeah, uh, Richard, I want to I want to ask you. <clears throat> I'm just kind of seeing a convergence of physical security in companies and the CSO role and the CISO role, and I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, and, and I think you know the traditional role was you know the director of information security, right, which has now merged to you know, or changed its roles very conveniently to be the chief, chief information security officer. But what we're seeing in a lot of organisations is that um, physical security is now rolling into the chief security role, the the CSO role, uh, because it makes obvious sense to secure physical security, door locks and and what have you uh, on premises. Uh, CCTV, you name it, they're all integrated together. As you mentioned, there's been this convergence and we're even beginning to see it around things like executive protection because you as a VIP can be triangulated by, based upon your phone, right? Your uh, Or your other gadgets or your schedule that may be out there and therefore, you know, perpetrators would know who you are. So to put things in a healthcare perspective, right? If I've got a VIP in one of my hospitals, um, undergoing simple simple surgery, um, a perpetrator can identify fairly quickly because IoT is not very secure, the devices that are attached to my particular patient and therefore mess with those devices and you know introduce patient safety risks, perhaps you know assassination via medical device. We're going to be a little bit James Bond here, but you know there is an obvious convergence of, of physical and information security at this juncture. And I'm glad you mentioned EP because if I mention it, everyone goes, what's he talking about? But at least you put it in context. And it's good that you mentioned it. Uh, not just I have my British Bodyguard Association cufflinks on. Jolly good. Jolly yeah. good. Um, uh, but but, but, but it, because we do have a panel later on with EP and physical security specialists um, as well. Why, you might say, why at an MSS forum? Well, and I actually... I don't normally give presentations because people don't normally want to hear from me, but I did it a couple of weeks ago at an event. And I said, did you know physical security distributors of CCTV access control and biometrics that some MSS and some MSPs are bundling it directly and therefore the interlocutor is changing? Hmm? Maybe we'll see a few of those things come out uh, throughout the day, but maybe that's a good juncture to go to David. Um, is that a key aspect, that converged bundling that we should talk about today? Yeah, I, I think the converged bundling of MSS services is, is important. I also think that the converged bundling of um, you know, platforms and, and general technology services is important. Um, when we talk about this OT, IT, cloud, on-prem, you know, Jamie was talking about how uh, the, the cloud debate is not finished yet. Keep in mind that there's nothing new under the sun. What we're really talking about are the characteristics, sometimes in opposition of specialty and ubiquity and cooling or compartmentalization. Um, and because of the broad abstraction of services into public cloud, uh, we sometimes have difficulty evaluating our threat and risk profiles as we move into the public cloud. Um, and, and in the future, I think that those services, the public cloud services will become both more ubiquitous and more granular. Uh, we'll be able to build assurance through establishment the same way that I don't think, you know, whether or not my calculator is, is compromised when I, when I do a simple calculation. Um, and furthermore, we'll allow the customer to select assets, which are absolutely truly critical for direct control. We'll extract in those assets, you know, the assets and, and uh, fixtures of their organization, which are commodity into a more stable infrastructure. Um, and we can apply that paradigm to any emerging technology, to any MSS platform. If an organization is unable to make the analysis themselves, that's where an MSS might come in. Uh, but at the end of the day, what organizations need to focus on is what is core to their business so that they then know what they can let go. You know, so that they then know what, you know, if it were compromised, does not represent risk profile to them and, and should be abstracted into a public cloud or a commodity service that doesn't place a burden on them. It's a very difficult call to make, uh, but I think that that's, that's where MSS uh, services need to focus and that's also where companies need to focus strategically is not getting too tied up in, in minutia about technology, but you know, thinking a little bit more about, about what it is they do as a company. 
something I'd like to speak to on this on-prem versus cloud. Uh, we all know about the Kaseya hack last year. And if you dig a little deeper into that, one of the problems we have here is they were maintaining both an on-prem version of their software and a cloud version. And the, and the on-prem version basically got forgotten because all the growth was coming and all the revenue was coming from the cloud, the new revenue. So I think it's important to look at your vendors and if you're still maintaining an on-prem version of their software and they have a cloud version, you need to evaluate that. You need to find out if, if you're still maintaining the software that is gonna be secure or not and whether you should make the move or if that company is truly invested in what you're doing as, a, as a, using that software and if they're there for you and protecting you. Because a lot of times that, that's not happening at your level where you're using the software um, as a company, it's happening at a level beyond you. And so I think that opens a lot of questions up. Yeah, that's a perfect example. That, that's that, that's a perfect example of, of you know getting caught up in kind of the on-prem versus you know versus cloud debate, feeling like you're covered, and in fact failing to you know see the the forest for the trees. I like that, and and it should be mentioned. One thing I forgot to mention earlier, David. Again, your approach is you know quite unique because you're an MSS that goes uh, to look to help the SMBs, which believe it or not is quite special because. Um, when we think of MSS, we, we, we think of uh, enterprise only, or, or, or some people do. Um, it, it, have I got that right, David? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah, and I, I don't know why it's special, because we haven't had trouble finding customers. We haven't had trouble helping them quite a bit. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is that the, that market requires, that that is the SMB market and medium enterprise requires help just as much as, you know, the, the giant prime contractors of the world. I would say more so quite frankly yeah perhaps more so <laughs> no that's that's uh, that's key but going to uh, the end customer side and jamie just i don't want to you know just always come back to you as the end customer but um what then do you want and and maybe this is a good time to have a message to all third parties um uh, what what should they better consider before trying to help you um do, do you even want one throat to choke or one you know thing or do you, or do you want a, a more sustainable supply chain what what is it you want yes so yeah thinking about the different comments it, it goes back to capability and i really like what david said what is core to your business because that's what we have to invest in that's what we're gonna if we're any business that's what makes us valuable that's what we bring to the world that's what's going to give us profitability so as an end user and, and all of us here, whether we're an end user or an MSSP or MSS, we all have vendors. We all have third parties that we have to manage this relationship. And what we want is the same as any other entity that's working with vendors and third parties. And that is partnership um, because we can leverage third parties to provide this capability and we should, but ultimately we cannot outsource our responsibility or our accountability, right? So we are ultimately, you know, accountable for making good decisions and, and managing these services. So I think our role in, in going back to the discussion about the CIO and the CISO and what the focus of the future is, I think it's that it's absolutely governance, it's risk management, it's accountability and you know, internally and with third parties, managing those relationships so that the company can be confident that we are doing what we have to do um, to provide a good risk-based organization that's making the right decisions for our company. So uh, I know it's a little bit long-winded there, but I'm really passionate about this because I think governance is the key thing, governance plus partnership. And we can't do it alone. We need to have a very strong partnership with the third parties. And I want to say, like, not just one person, but the different people who bring the expertise that will help us partner together. So I think I believe in a team based approach. There should be more than one person within the end user company that's collaborating with the third party. And I think that should also go on the other side. There definitely needs to be a single point of contact, but it should not be a one to one relationship. I think it should be many to many. Which is is imperfect because my my sort of my next angle which I don't know, maybe I can give to Dr. Priyadarshi. I mean, Jamie mentions not maybe a single person. And, and actually, when, when people say, oh, the CISO of tomorrow, we can forgive them if they don't have technical ability because they don't hang out with the engineers and, and, and so on. But right, m maybe, maybe we can. But, but, but does that, Dr. Priyadarshi, mean that there won't be a CISO, a CDO, C CISO? It's going to be a 
the office of the CISO in, in more than one occasion? Yeah, I think, um, as Jamie said, uh, you know, it's a multi, multiple to multiple relationship. And so no one person can get uh, all aspects of it, right? And I look, I look, I look in comparison to the chief digital officer's role in various companies, uh, friends around around in various industries. Uh, of course, we are a service company as well, so we have a different role to play uh, in that sense. So we guide we guide our customers into how the best organizations can be, especially when it comes to deploying cloud platforms. So the days are days are this this whole organization, whatever it, the name, new name could be, uh, I would call it. A solution provider, you know, uh, whether it is internal or whether it is external, the complete you need solutions. We can't have point software or point uh, script to do certain things. But every uh, end customer requires a solution, and that means you bring in different sets of people. Whether it is the uh, actual physical security, whether it is the network security, whether it is the uh, edge device security, all these people, each one requires a different expertise, so to say. And then you bring them together as to what is the best combination in your own context, right? If I, like, for example, if you look at a very small, uh, uh, since David was talking about, David is in the SMB space, many years ago, I did what is called a small business success index uh, uh, research for a couple of years, longitudinal study. And one of the things that came out of that was the need for security professionals and security guidance. And uh, it has still, as Richard said, it's still needed and that is true. Uh, but even in bigger energy sector, if you look, it's the same challenge, right? You, some companies are small and some companies are big, but they're not as small as literally SMB definition, but uh, they can't afford to have uh, a so-called uh, a whole organization for it, but they can actually partner with MSS, MSSPs, and actually bring in the right uh, talent. So I think it's a, it will be always a organization which is combination of multiple skills. I would not put a name to it right now. No, but that's refreshing. That's refreshing because uh, you know separately I run a convergence forum and the people bemoan, oh, we've been talking convergence for 20 years. Yes, but the, the, the nuance is that 20 years ago, people were wondering if you have a super kidnap and ransom script kitty uh, who, who, who's you know hacker by night or whatever. And now we're saying it's a, the who you're going to call strategy. Um, and, and as Richard, uh, maybe you can elaborate on the chief innovation officer as opposed to chief information officer. May, maybe that's the way forward. Um, the, the, the connector, just as people are saying there should no longer be a CEO. Why, why would you? They can't manage things. That's why you have a managing director. Should be a chief engagement officer. Um, I have no, you know, opinion too much anyway. But what, what do you think, Richard? Well, I, I certainly like your ideas about CEOs because some of the CEOs I've uh, I've worked for over the years or worked with over the years seem more concerned about their, you know, their 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 uh, bonuses and their stock price than they do about the well-being of the company that they've been put singly in charge of. And I, I think that's uh, uh, something that, you know, corporate America uh, in particular needs to address. And we're probably talking to the right forum here in the DC arena to, uh, to maybe address that. But uh, I, I think all of these positions are all in a state of flux, quite frankly. I don't think anything's going to change overnight, but I think they are going to continue to evolve. And I think they need to continue to evolve as businesses evolve, as the technologies and functions that businesses uh, require in order to make money or provide services or do whatever they do changes. And as uh, the equation between risk and reward is continually challenged by things like cybersecurity, right? And um, new high risk, um, you know, business ventures, shall we say. Indeed. Yeah, those, those high risk business ventures, even if they don't know they're high risk, because you might be making one component and then your net you know your next uh, down the supply chain is something quite uh, quite tricky and and we're going to look at cmmc and its implications for both physical and cyber so that's going to be good fun um tom uh, what would your hope be for this event if, if 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 you have a message for people attending and you say well by the end of this i hope you would have fill in the blank what 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 what, what do you hope we could uh, achieve tom well, I think everyone has spoken to this in some way is you really need to evaluate your core competencies, 
what you want to be responsible for, what you can actually handle, whether you're an MSP, an MSSP, your internal IT, you know, your internal IT in a government position, you really need to, to figure out what really you can be responsible for and what you don't want to be because we're in such a situation where everything is so visible now and we have social media and the news that if you have a problem, it's probably going to get out there and it's going to cause you severe problems in, in either for as you as an employee or your business and you just don't want to be in that situation. So establishing those ground rules and finding the right companies and other entities to contract with and offload some of that responsibility is important. Have this stuff contracted up, have an understanding, and make sure you're protected, both both from a perspective of cybersecurity, but also from these, you know, uh, how you are, how you positioned, and how you look in case something happened. Love it. Yeah, that's 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 great advice, and 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 hopefully people will start to frame their, you know, even their attendance of this event. They go right. Well, this is this is what we're going to look out for. Um, let let's do a quick tour de force uh, to to conclude. Um, David, uh, sort of same question, but what would what would your hope be uh, at the end of this? What what do you think we could have maybe hoped to achieve from an MSS perspective? From an MSS perspective, you know, help your customers think outside of themselves they've probably gotten themselves wrapped around the axle on you know some kind of compliance concern or some kind of a, a risk concern um and short of being a practitioner themselves in which case why are you providing services to a practitioner of security um it's unlikely that cybersecurity is a core competency for them and so as an mss you know package services that allow them to get on with business once they've been honest with themselves about what it is they do package something that allows them to get on with business and allows them to be protected appropriately um, according to the risk that they incur in the course of their business, not, you know, not incur the project risk of building out a cybersecurity practice on their own. Indeed. And, and, that, and that, that works when you are a trusted advisor and, and, and you're building it out appropriate for, for, for them. I like that word. Um, Jamie, uh, obviously, you know, there, there's probably third parties that say, hey, I've got the latest thing that I've bundled now. You can inc include it in a package and, and, and so on. W Imagine they are a trusted advisor. What, what are you looking for from, from, from that? And maybe that's something that we can try and tease out from throughout the day. Yeah, um, trusted partnership, right? So solutions, as was discussed by everyone, solutions that really meet our needs because even as an end user, even those of us that do have some cybersecurity um, expertise, we still are not necessarily as in depth as the MSS or the MSSP um, from that perspective. So as a trusted partner, having that, having that advocate who's really bringing to us solutions that will improve our needs and our context and, um, and, and facilitating the conversations internally. So requesting that the people from the end user environment are brought to the table to facilitate those workshops that will lead to solutions that only a trusted advocate could provide i like it only only a trusted advocate could could provide um all right then then let, let's take that to dr priyadashi trusted advocate um mss of the future um what do you think then maybe maybe from an ot side what do you think we can hope to have achieved at the end of today i think um how do we uh, literally streamline this integration of itot it is essential uh, it's, it, it will be needed as more and more of, as I said, the 5G networks or the other emerging technology devices that get deployed. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good time to start thinking how to actually streamline this flow. Okay, streamlining and, and, and flow. I love that. Um, upstream, downstream, it's still a flow. Um, and, and, and Richard, uh, obviously, you've seen a lot of, of, of this. How, how could we make a difference with our DMV event? I think we're lucky with the DMV because it's actually quite a specific and unique flavored you know, location. But, but how can we really make a difference with a, a conference like this? Um, I would say we need to get a lot more strategic, right? And that means that leaders of companies, unless you're a Fortune 500, um, you, know, you need to take your fireman's helmet off, put down your axe, take a step back, look at the environment in which you are doing business and continually come back and reevaluate that environment on a periodic basis of every six months or, or, or something. Look at the threats and risks that are facing the organization 
reevaluate those threats and risks and their potential impact to your organization. In other words, what is the cost of loss? What is the cost of reputation? What is the impact to business or services, right? If power, we, we saw what happens when an oil pipe, a simple oil pipeline goes down because they can no longer bill for the, the meterage of it, right? Um, if, if we had a, a major critical infrastructure attack against the entire power grid, then what impact would that have? That would be a knock-on impact across thousands and thousands of businesses, thousands of government departments, schools, colleges, you name it. Everything would essentially go down. So look at the, imp the impact chain, right? And look at your ability to protect against those sorts of threats and ask the question, does it make sense for me to build this myself, right? Do I have uh, the right capabilities on staff? Could I attract and retain the right capa detailed capabilities that I need for these, these skills? Does it make sense for me to try and hire them based upon the money that I've got available or the salary caps and salary scales that I have? Bearing in mind, this is a highly competitive business, right? And that Google and Microsoft are going to you know, come in with some astronomical sum to try and pull away a lot of your top people there. Do you need an FTE on staff for someone that you are gonna use two days a year? Or does it make sense to bring that in as an expert service, as more of a, a leveraged, uh, leveraged model, right? And I think there is a tremendous need for a core cap uh, for some, you know, uh, some security capabilities here that, that doesn't make sense for you to have on staff unless you're a, uh, you know, a Halliburton or a Fortune 500 or or someone of, of that magnitude where you can build out, you know, a 200 person SOC and staff at 24 by seven. You can have a, a massive IR team, right? You can have um, all kinds of threat intelligence uh, coming into your to your your, uh, your your team. You've got uh, BCP DR capabilities that are multiple, you know, N plus four type capabilities, for example, right? So that in the event of attack, you are resilient. I think resiliency is really what we all need to be looking towards, you know, in the, in the future. Which is great because we're, we're going to do an entire thing on resiliency next, which, which is a good segue. Well, Thank you. Go. Thank I'll you. Set up the next section for you then. I like it. Thank you. Um, well, well, you know, Richard, Jamie, uh, Dr. Pridoshi, David and Tom, thanks for uh, opening us up, uh, getting us awake, getting us thinking of all the topics we're going to be doing today. And of course, this top post holder. Um, I've really enjoyed this panel. Let's give you a big virtual uh, clap o already. Daniel in Discord is saying great panel. Um, you know, thanks uh, ever so much. I'll, I'll, I'll put you back in the audience, but uh, but I look forward to seeing you throughout the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Perfect.